Uh, okay, great. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, digital scholarship, and I've tried to kind of sum it up in, in five lessons that kind of hopefully hit home for you. Uh, but really, you should never trust anyone who comes along and tries to give you lessons about a world that's changing very rapidly, because usually they're trying to sell you something. Um, so my first advice is completely ignore everything I'm about to say. But, um, but really, my alternative title would be something like this. You know, it's just some things I've come to think about technology and, and academic practice which are connected to some vague movies and videos, which wasn't as snappy a title, so I went with the, the, the five lessons thing. So uh, this talk, I'm going to talk a bit about digital scholarship, uh, then go through these five lessons, uh, and then I want to talk about uh, academic identity, which I think is really relevant for, for you lot, um, and give you a kind of a metaphor to think about that, which you can throw away. The, the point of metaphors is they can be a bit rubbish, but at least they make you think about things. And then think about what it means for you, and we might have time for a discussion as well at the end, hopefully. Uh, so, as I just said, I've I published a book called The Digital Scholar. Uh, I'm a big open access advocate nut, so it's published by Bloomsbury Academic, but it's available freely under a Creative Commons license, so you can read it for free. So, uh, most of the stuff's in more, in more detail there. Now, you're a first year PhD student, so uh, you're probably being told all the time. Be clear about your definitions about what things are. So uh, I don't really like definitions much. But for me, when I talk about digital scholarship, it's, it's really a shorthand for the intersection of these three things coming together. So digital technologies uh, and all kind of media being available in digital format, shared over an inter uh, international global network and also a social network, and then intersecting with open practice, open technologies, open data. And it's when those three things come together, we start to get transformative practice. So you, know, you could be a digital scholar in that you, know, you write your papers in Word, uh, but, you never, but you publish them in closed access journals uh, and you store it in your desk and don't, never, never talk to anyone online. That wouldn't really be much of a change of practice. So digital is really just a shorthand for all these things. Um, so if we want to think about what digital, and digital or open can be kind of synonymous in this sense, um, you can think about what, these, what people tend to do who we might want to define as digital scholars or open scholars. And they don't necessarily do all of these things, they're not kind of a prescriptive list, they might do others as well, but these are the type of characteristics you might see. They tend to have a kind of distributed online identity, so you'll see them in lots of different places. They'll be in Twitter and they'll have a blog and uh, other places. Uh, but often they have a central place for identity. If you wanted to go to them, they'd be the person who does those really good podcasts or they run that really good blog or whatever. Um, they have a very kind of cultivated online network of peers, which is as important, if not more so, than their face-to-face -face network of peers, and often the two overlap. Um, they develop a, what we often call a personal learning environment, just kind of gather together a set of tools that become useful for them, often by sort of trial and error. Um, they engage with open publishing, open access publishing, you know, that's kind of a real uh, thing here. So particularly if you're engaged with social media, that there is no point putting a link out, so here's, here's my fantastic article I've just written, I'm doing a tweet to that, and then when someone goes to it, it says, now pay $45 to access this article. You, know, you may as well go and bury it in your back garden, it's just it's dead to that world. So uh, open access publishing is kind of key to all this. Um, they often create a range of informal outputs, so it's not just traditional outputs, but you know, blog posts, videos, those other things. Um, they'll try new technologies, so if something comes along that might be relevant, try it out, see if it fits in. Um, the next one, mixing personal and professional outputs, uh, there's a kind of continuum there. Some people keep it very strict, kind of there's a very strict divide between their personal and private life. Other people give, probably give you way too much detail about their personal life that you don't need to know. Uh, and, and, but a lot of people are kind of in the middle. They mix those two things, because really when you're engaged in a lot of these, these uh, domains, uh, it's, it's the person you're connecting with rather than just being kind of a broadcast medium. Uh, they'll use new technologies to support teaching and research. So they'll always look at things, how can I fit this into my course or to my research? Uh, and the last one's probably the most important, the kind of, there's a kind of default approach that you automatically share your outputs in many ways. Uh, so the book talks about the work of uh, Ernest Boyer, who uh, in 1990 looked at the work of thousands of US academics, and he was trying to see what is it that academics do, what is it that a scholar does, and sort of try to characterise all the things they do on a daily basis. And he broke it down into these four categories, which were discovery, which is kind of genesis original research, uh, integration, which is taking information across disciplines and applying it. Uh, application, which is taking expertise and might be applying that to industry or doing public engagement, uh, and teaching and learning. And he, he was saying all four of those are, are equally important, though often we kind of tend to 
put extra emphasis on the first one. So in the book, I kind of go through each of those four categories and say how uh, digital scholarship is impacting upon each of them. But that's not what I'm going to do now. I'm going to do my five lessons instead. Uh, OK, so uh, the first thing is, I think often when you talk to people, I, I hang around quite a lot with software developers who I like very much, but um, they often end up speaking a different language. And, and it's sometimes a bit confusing. You think, what's this got to do with, you know, I'm, I'm an academic in you know, medieval literature or whatever it is, and what's this got to do with me? I think it can get a bit, get a bit confusing. So if we could just uh, play this video. Thanks. So sometimes that's kind of, you get caught up in this world and that's what it, the conversations end up like. And it's very easy to kind of get away from what's that got to do with my everyday practice. Now, let's talk about profitability or whatever it was. So, um, so I think the, the, the thing is, is we need to kind of step back from that and not get kind of befuddled by that. Because underneath all that stuff, all that nonsense, it's also about all these things as well. You know, different ways of sharing knowledge, different ways of creating knowledge through distributed networks. Different ways of forming networks that used to you have to kind of you'd have to go around the world on, on doing the kind of keynote circuit to kind of maintain these big peer networks, which now you can do while you're having breakfast in the morning. Different ways of generating ideas, sort of putting stuff out there and getting feedback very quickly. Different ways of communicating and disseminating your research, and also different ways of, of learning and teaching as well. And those are all really good scholarly activities. Those are things that we we all care about. Um, so, Sir so Martin Rees is the Astronomer Astron Royal, uh, I'm never sure if this is pronounced, it's Archive or Archive. I don't know if people know about this site. So, it's a, it's a physics site where you put a pre-publication site, and it's become the, the default site to go to for all kind of physics publications. So, people put it up there before it gets published anywhere, and, and their only kind of criteria for exception is that it would be sent out to review uh, for a normal journal, but they don't judge the quality for it at all. And it can then go on to be published in journals, but it's a really quick way to get stuff up there and published and looked at. He said it's kind of really transforming the way the physics community um, works. And I think if, well, if it's good enough for Sir Martin Rees, there's probably something in it for, for most of us as well. So I think the first lesson is kind of accept that there is something here that's relevant to what you do and, and avoid all that kind of uh, that nonsense stuff. Um, the second one is researchers, I think, are caught in a dilemma between some of the possibilities of the new technologies and the everyday context they need to exist in. Universities and higher education isn't always the, the most fast changing uh, of, in, of uh, institutions, as you can find yourself kind of caught between these two st stalls, if you like. Uh, could we place, this is one that starts about a minute in, if you could do that, that'd be great. Okay, so the point he's making there is that um, this kind of massive global exposure has kind of really speeded up innovation in, in dance. I'm not going to do any of those moves. Um, and you might think, well, could similar things happen in research? Could we kind of really speed up the innovation cycle? There, there are possibilities there. And I'm going to come on to some of the possibilities of, uh, of research as well, the kind of how it impacts the way we do research. But at the same time, there's been a whole uh, raft of studies done about how academics engage with new technologies. A lot of these were around 2010. And the kind of message across all of them was, was, was pretty similar, which was, it's kind of very cautious. So, uh, Proctor Williams and Stewart said that um, frequent or intensive use of social media and new technologies was rare, uh, and some people regard it as a waste of time or even dangerous. You know, so, don't, don't do not approach. Um, I think Harley et al's study was looking at uh, early career researchers, and they said there was no kind of evidence to suggest that these kind of tech savvy young graduates coming in and, and bucking the practice. Uh, and Carpenter Sal said that uh, researchers were often risk averse about adopting new technologies. So it's interesting why, why that might be so. Uh, I th and the first thing that often comes up is the idea of tenure. If you want to get promotion or recognise in your field or a full time job, um, then the, the advice you get is kind of pretty consistent across all fields often. So don't waste your time on the other nonsense publishing the proper journals like, like what I did, and that will get you a, a job here. So, in some ways, I think higher education is quite strange in that, in that sense. Um, in, in a lot of other sectors, when you have new, new people come in, you kind of think, these are the people with new ideas, we can learn from them. Whereas in higher education, we get those new people in and then we, we grind it out of them and say, <laughs> don't do any of that new stuff, just do everything like we used to. So, you're kind of immediately up against, you know, you're in a vulnerable position often as a new researcher, you're trying to get a job and you're being told the way to get a job is to behave in this way. 
Uh, it's also, I think, just part of the nature of being an, an academic. So this guy was looking at um, scientists who blog and says it's kind of, it's against their nature, really, the, the whole kind of way they've been trained. As a scientist, you kind of, you work very cautiously, and when you've got evidence, you come out and say things, and you hedge what you want to say, and you say, well, the evidence sort of backs itself. Whereas blogging is a completely different culture. It's like saying stuff immediately, responding to things, and, and, uh, and being very current. So it kind of goes against the way a lot of people have been trained. It might also just be habit. Uh, so the, these people were looking at the, kind of the research groups that people form, and, sent, and they tended to form groups from people they knew, people they knew at conferences, people they'd worked with before, rather than sort of taking advantage of social networking and stuff. So um, the second lesson, I think, is to kind of, first of all, just recognize that there is this tension between the context you need to exist in and uh, some of the possibilities of the new, new technologies, and to try and resolve that tension. I'm talking about some of those. Uh, resolutions in a minute. Um, the third lesson is looking at how we can do dissemination. Now, we're all broadcasters now. So I work at the Open University. A lot of you are probably too young to remember those Open University programs that used to be on in the 1970s. Like, before we had 24-hour TV, the only thing that would be on when you came home from the pub was black and white lectures from the Open University. And uh, this is a fry and lorry sketch which is sort of taking the mickey out of those. So if you could play that, please. So that's what public engagement used to be like. You'd have to have a kind of a big broadcaster to do it. Um, so at the Open University, we've started trying to move to kind of a more internet native stuff to do. The point of that was really just that um, that, that type of content is meant to be the sort of stuff that people will pass around on social media and embed and share. So it's, just, it's trying to do a different thing than that, uh, that early kind of TV broadcast stuff. But I think what's, but even that's still kind of quite high. high quality stuff and you kind of get professionals into to voice over and all that kind of stuff. But I think what's probably more interesting is when you, you come away one step further is, is think of the acad every academic as a, as a content production system, if you like. And actually higher education is, does everyone know the idea of the long tail? You know, it's the idea is that, that Amazon makes its money by selling lots of, uh, only a few items of lots of copies. So you, you might only sell two or three copies of lots of different books. And so the idea is that not many people see these things, but there's lots of it out there. Uh, and higher education is really kind of a long-tail content production system in many ways. We produce all this stuff, so we produce research papers, um, we produce software code, if that's the thing we're into, we produce lots of teaching content, lectures, we generate ideas, we generate data out of research projects, we do conferences, seminars, things like this, uh, we engage in debate. Now, with not much effort, all of those things can be made open, access so that people can access all of them and, and share them and they become content that's out there. So we become the broadcasters. And these digital outputs kind of behave in a slightly different way from that traditional uh, broadcast stuff. They're often low cost to produce if not free. They have a small but sometimes unpredictable audience so you do get those things that rumble on and suddenly take off and become viral. Um, they're open, so they can be taken up and easily reused. Uh, there's, there's no sense of compromise in them, really, from you as an academic, which is really appealing. I know lots of people who work in TV, you know, and they say, you kind of, because you've got to, you know, you're putting a lot of money into this, you kind of got to reach as wide an audience as possible. So they, they don't just have Brian Cox saying stuff, they have to go on top of a mountain and point dramatically to say something, and they do lots of fast cuts. So, so you're kind of compromised as an academic about what you want to say. Whereas with this stuff, because it doesn't cost you anything to produce, you know, you can go into as much boring detail as you like because it doesn't, doesn't really matter again. So that there's no kind of compromise around what you're doing. You're not worried about those, those demographics of the audience. There's a very high reuse potential because they're, they're designed to be picked up and shared and embedded and passed around. And they have a different distribution model, so people have tracked how this stuff gets passed around through social networks and stuff. And related to that, we can think of other different types of researcher skills uh, that are developing as well. I'm not suggesting that everyone needs to have all of these skills, but the type of things that you see cropping up, so some, some people are really good at producing videos that attract people's attention. So if you've done a really good research project, you know, rather than just put out the 300-page report about it, you know, why not do a, a five, 10-minute snappy video that, that kind of highlights those findings? Uh, some people are really good at networking and, and become the, the, the kind of key go-to people in the networks. Uh, things like data visualization, so mapping your data in, in pretty ways that are meaningful to people. 
uh, analytics. I think we've only really started to touch the surface of what we can do with analytics. So a lot of you probably run things like Google Analytics, but we'll probably start to embed that into our research proposals. Instead of just saying, you know, we're going to do some dissemination, there might be things like, you know, we expect to have this many hits on our site with a bounce rate where people stay for this long, and we would expect these to be the most popular sites. And, and it's really interesting to do that when you run analytics on any site. You suddenly, the things you think are interesting aren't necessarily the things that people are coming to. Um, the idea of being a curator or, or a filter for all the stuff that's out there is a really useful function. So um, I'm, I'm an educational technologist. Uh, in my field, there's a guy called Stephen Downs who does a blog. He does a daily blog of all the things he's read, and he's been doing this for years. And it's a kind of invaluable source. It's anyone who comes into my area and starts blogging, it's, they always follow Stephen Downs. Um, so I don't know where he has the time to do this. But it's a strange thing, really, because within any university, that curation function that he performs wouldn't be recognised as something that would get him promotion, because it's not a publication in any kind of sense. But it's a really valuable thing for the community. Uh, learning how to write for the online medium is very different from writing um, uh, in, in an academic sense. I had the reverse the other day, so um, last year I was writing my book, uh, and when I came to write it, I thought, I've been kind of blogging about this for the past two or three years. So I went back to my blog, which is a really good thing to keep a blog, and I found that by gathering together all the kind of relevant uh, posts, I had about 20, 30,000 words, which is kind of roughly in the topic of the book. But, they, but the tone was wrong for a book. I kind of had to go through and alter them. It was, it was a different type of tone, yeah. Um, live blogging is another kind of score. I've got a, a, a friend, Doug Clough, who uh, does live blogging. I'm sure he's actually live blogging it before the person has actually said it. It's a really kind of uh, great skill to have. So uh, these are the type of skills that might be really useful in, in cultivating that, those kind of online researcher identity. I think often people try and portray digital scholarship as being in competition with um, traditional practice. You kind of, you're either one or the other. You choose which camp you're in and that's it. Uh, but I think it's much better to think of it being complementary, actually. So all the things you might want to do, like publish papers or give keynotes or go to presentations or be recognised in your field, are all backed up by having a good online identity, publishing online, sharing ideas and those kind of things. Uh, so lesson three is to learn how to use the network to um, enhance engagement and dissemination in your subject. Um, so I now I want to talk about rethinking some of those research approaches. Uh, if you could just play this video, thanks. Um, so that's a kind of a business pitch this guy does, but I think the point he's making there is about the kind of just do it approach. And that's one thing that digital technology really allows you to do, is to just do it. And so I always talk about this idea of guerrilla research, which isn't research into guerrillas, it's a kind of guerrilla approach to research. Um, and that's kind of really the idea of just do it. Use open data. So um, I like this quote from Larry Lessig, the founder of Creative Commons, who's talking about the film, The Social Network. He says, what was important about uh, Facebook and Zuckerberg wasn't the invention, but that he, he could create that platform and put it out there and get everyone to sign up for it without asking anyone's permission. It was that lack of permission that was the kind of really important thing in all this. And I think that's the key to the idea of guerrilla research as well. So if I was to have a guerrilla research manifesto, uh, it would be something along these lines. So something you can just do by yourself or just with a friend. You, know, you don't need to get together a big research team and have memorandums of understanding and that kind of stuff. Uh, you, you try and use open existing data, you, you, something you can do now. You don't need to gather that data or set up a big, long research project. You know, there's data out there, access it. It's fairly quick to realise it's something you can knock together now. And you can publish out of it, um, but also it can be disseminated via blog, social media, and key, it doesn't require permission to do it. So I'll give some uh, examples. I mean, obviously, obviously, this doesn't apply to everything. If you're building a large Hadron Collider, not, not the way to go. You know. So. Um, interestingly, it might be a more efficient way to work as well. So I did some analysis of the uh, Research Funding Council and how much time people spend in this. They said in 2006 they estimated the average time was uh, 12 days people would spend on writing a proposal to one of those councils. I think that's an underestimate because I've written those proposals. 12 days is quite light. Um, only 17% of bids are successful to ESRC. Um, and there were 2,800 bids submitted in 2009 which had gone up. Um, and so if you're thinking it, just for one from ESRC, there are 
a roughly sort of 2,000 failed bids a year times 12 days for each bid, that's 65 years of effort every year to write, paper, to write submissions to, ESO, to one research council, which we never see because people don't make this stuff open. That doesn't seem to me a very efficient system of how to, to operate. So the sort of things you can do with uh, the kind of guerrilla research approach, you can start your own journal. Just go and do this. So um, Google published a WordPress uh, plugin called Anotum, which is, just makes a blog look like a journal. So just as a test, I thought I'm going to start what I called the Meta EdTech Journal. So um, I, I don't run it anymore because it's just a test. But what I did was I went through, I found a list which someone else had published of all the open access educational technology journals. And I went through sort of every three months and found 10 papers that I liked. And because they're open access, I could then republish them here with a comment. So I was making a, a journal about other journals. And my, my one's pretty boring, it's just about educational technology. But you can imagine doing some really interesting things between disciplines that you probably wouldn't be able to justify creating a proper journal for because there wouldn't be a big enough audience that would cost money. But you can just do it yourself. I'm going to create this journal because I think it's interesting. Uh, invent an app today. So um, these are some of my colleagues at the Open University. Uh, we, we created the OU's first Facebook app. And our driving principle for that, and we did it in, in the pub, was um, that we should pretend we're third-party developers. So we had no special access to data or anything. And actually, there's an awful lot you can do in that way. But you, you, you need a friendly programmer, a, a tame programmer. It's, it's Liam, this guy on the right here. Uh, so we created a, an app which allowed Open University students to say which course they were studying, and then if other people had put the, the app on their profile, they could find other people studying the same course, and they could share their study story, and they could create study groups together, um, and, they could, and we created another app, which is My OU Stories, they could then say how they were feeling, and that would post on their timeline as well, connecting with other people. And it's been really successful, it's now been adopted as the Open University's proper app. But you know, we didn't need anyone's permission to do that, we needed someone who could do it, but you, you could just go ahead and do it. Uh, you can interrogate data very quickly. So one of the guys in that photo previously was Tony Hurst. Um, he loves playing around with open data. Uh, so there's lots of data out there you can just take and you can put it through free tools if you're into that kind of thing. So I think this is a tool called Gephi. Um, so what he was looking at was, uh, I don't know if any of you watched the, the Sherlock TV series. Uh, the BBC created a, a blog on it, which was as if Dr. Watson in the series was writing the blog. And he looked at the people who had shared the link to that blog and how they were connected, which is kind of just slightly interesting. But you can imagine doing that for your research findings. Now, who's looking at my paper that I've tweeted and how are they connected? And are there people then who I could talk to who I didn't know before? There were different communities talk, looking at my research that we could go across and talk to. So I think digital technologies allow us to rethink the way we think of, tech, of, of the research process. We've kind of been, we've become locked into a certain way of thinking about it and we, and we can sometimes think that's the only way to do it. So over on the left is kind of the traditional approach. You have an idea, you write, you write a proposal about it, you submit that proposal, you wait probably quite a long time, you probably get rejected. But say, say you're lucky enough to get funding, you then do a two-year project, whatever, around the research. At the end of it, you write a paper, you send it off to a journal, you probably wait a really long time, and then eventually it's published. You know? So there could be three years between you know, that cycle. And on the right is the kind of uh, guerrilla research approach. You have an idea that afternoon while out walking the dog, you find some open data, you do that research in, a, in an hour or so, you blog it, you're done, you're kind of, that's it. And I think what I want to go is you can think of this stuff as kind of having this, not all research has to be of one size, and not all outputs need to be of one size. There's kind of different granularity before. I think beforehand we had, we had just apples, if you like. We had, we had different types of apples, and they were very nice apples, but we just had apples. And now we have apples and kumquats and all sorts of things to come and choose from. Uh, Stephen Heppel makes this, this observation that we continue to make the error of trying to take technology and get it to bend to our current practice rather than allowing it to free us from what we used to do and think differently. I think that applies to how we think of research. <clears throat> so I think lesson four is to think that there are new research possibilities which sit alongside the, the existing ones and not necessarily replacing them. Uh, and so the last thing is to think about uh, how we think about risk when we come to this. If we could just play this clip. Okay, so I'm sure a lot of us can relate to that. And I think, but the idea is here that, so there's been quite a few books um, out recently 
which is sort of so, patent's idea of this kind of educational technology or education digital te technology uh, dystopia is kind of we thought stuff was going to be really good and actually it's turned out to be really bad. Um, I think there's a lot of this links back to uh, what Tversky and Kahneman, uh, psychologists in the 70s, called prospect theory. And we're kind of programmed to think this way, if you like. Uh, we give risk and loss more weight emotionally, cognitively, than we do gain. So, um, the f so losing 10 pounds hurts you more than the joy of finding 10 pounds. And so we, we, we become, we're naturally risk averse. So when we think about new practices, we tend to think of what we might lose, and what the potential risks are. Uh, James Bowles says, you know, we're very good at seeing the downstairs, the downstairs, the, the downsides, and the dangers of open systems. He says, these dangers are real, and he's not kind of dismissing them. He says, we're not so good at seeing the benefits, and the converse holds true for the closed systems we were talking about, uh, the publishing system, just before the break. It's like, and if I tried to sell you the idea of the current academic publishing model, you would think I was mad if it didn't already exist. Um, and something, you, know, you don't know where it's going to end, so I started blogging back in 2000. Can, can you guess where I am? So um, back in 2005, I started blogging, and I didn't think much about it. And I connected with lots of people through blogs. And there's people in my field, there's people like Stephen Downs, George Siemens, uh, Jay Cross. And a couple of years ago, I got invited to go to India because um, one of the guys had run the first MOOCs. So George Siemens was one of the first guys to run one of these big open courses MOOCs. And a guy in India had taken it and said, I really love MOOCs. I think they're really important for India. Can you get together some people? And I knew George because we'd been big blogging friends for a long time, so I got invited to go to India, which was fun. You know. um, so when I started blogging, I could have thought of all the downsides. I thought, it's going to take me time. It's going to probably detract from things I would publish formally. But you wouldn't think, but I may end up in the Taj Mahal. You know, so it's kind of difficult to predict those positive outcomes. A really good example is from, which is relevant to you, I think, is um, my PhD student, Katie Jordan. Uh, she was, in, in her first year, she was doing, she, she's doing some stuff around data visualization. So she took one of these MOOCs, one of these open courses on data visualization. Uh, and for the final project, you had to kind of create a, a, an, an online visualization. So she went out there and found all of the data about MOOC completion rates. How many people actually finish MOOCs? And the answer is not many. And she plotted it all and put it on her blog and just sort of left it up. They're using some free software. And this guy in the States, Phil Hill, who writes a, a blog called Eliterate, picked up and it said, like, this is the most complete picture of MOOC completion rates we've, we've seen. It's really important. So it became the, the de facto piece for everyone to go to to talk about MOOC completion rates. It ended up being mentioned in Private Eye and all this kind of stuff. We then got invited to submit a formal proposal to, to the Gates Foundation to look at MOOC research completion rates and went to a conference in Dallas and this kind of stuff. So I think it's just an interesting example of how that kind of open practice has led on to things that are both formally accepted, but also kind of just engagement and identity. So my last lesson is embrace unpredictability. I'm slightly running out of time, aren't I? Uh, so just to recap on those five lessons, uh, accept that it's relevant to you, uh, resolve that tension between existing practice and new possibilities, Think about using the network for engagement and promotion. Explore some of those new possibilities for research uh, and don't be too put off by some of the risk. So in summary, it's all about uh, openness and operating in the open creates impact. Um, now I was going to talk a bit about identity, but I don't know if I have time, so I'll briefly mention this. Um, I think what's interesting is that ac academic identity is being reshaped when we come online. Um, and it's almost like there are two sets of cultures. There's your kind of traditional disciplinary culture, which has a certain set of norms. And then there's the online world, which has a different set of norms, cultural norms. And how those two intersect is very different. Um, and my analogy is it's a bit like mountain folk. OK, so but bear with me on this one. So um, in, man, in many ways, mountain folk in different parts of the world have more in common with each other than they do with People, the rest of the people in the country who aren't mountain folk. And it sometimes feels that way um, with online people. So bloggers in different disciplines have as much, if not more, in common than a, blo than a blogger and a non-blogger in the same discipline. So my metaphor here is that open scholars are a bit like mountain dwellers, you're kind of digital scholars. So they have an affinity to their own discipline, but also a, an identity with that kind of those online uh, network practice. And sometimes these are in conflict and sometimes they're complementary. 
Uh, to lastly sum up, um, there is good news in all this. I think sometimes it can get a bit depressing. And I think you lot are kind of really, it's, just, it's more pertinent to you than almost anyone else. Uh, these are actually really exciting times to be a, an academic involved in education. It's really possible to do innovation. I talked about that kind of guerrilla research type stuff, the example that of, of Katie Jordan as well. You can very quickly, it's quite a democratized space. You can have an impact in your discipline by just being online and, and having a good profile. You can have, you can do, there's new ways of teaching, there's new ways of conducting research, and new ways of um, connecting. But there is some bad news too. Um, you're kind of screwed both ways. So you can't, <laughs> you kind of have to play that traditional game as well you, you, that you will need to um, publish in those papers. But I think you need to find a way of making it work for you. There is some risk, you know, I think that we, we hear the horror stories of people who kind of get sacked for saying the wrong thing online. So you kind of need to cultivate the online identity very carefully. Uh, I think we'll begin to see increased control from universities about what people do and say online. Um, unfortunately, it's not well understood by the people who might be giving you jobs and promotions and those kind of things, because that they got to where they are by going through the different, the traditional routes. And so when you, so we know what a good publication record looks like. We don't know what a good blogging profile looks like necessarily. And in some ways, you can't afford not to do it, though. I'm afraid, so uh, because there'll be the, the person who's in your field who's got the the good online profile. They'll be the one getting the invites to the conferences and stuff. So, uh, in summary, I think defining your relationship to openness is, is key to scholarship in many ways. So, how do you feel about open courses, using open tools, uh, open educational resources, uh, open data, open access publishing, uh, open source software, and particularly, I think, the idea of open identity, establishing your identity in an online uh, open environment. And that's it. We might have time for a question or two, but you can disagree with me.